Um, I'm Maggie. Um, for people who don't know me, um, I'm part of the Emory's debate team. And um, today I'm going to be talking to you about counterplans. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and use the whiteboard function to try to take some notes to make it a little bit more helpful um, for y'all, hopefully, to be able to see um, uh, what's going on with counterplans. If I can figure out how to type. Okay. So one thing to think about when approaching a counterplan is um, where the basis for a counterplan comes from in debate. So you might remember from an earlier lecture, um, the traditional role for the AF in the debate is to affirm the resolution. And the traditional role for the NEG in the debate is to uh, negate the AF. And so they can do this in a bunch of different ways. And one of the ways that teams are allowed to negate the AF is through reading counterplans. So from this, the function of the counterplan is to uh, solve some or all of the AF um, in order to negate it. So to kind of disprove the idea that the AF is the only way to solve whatever problem the AF is proposing. So solve some or all of the AF is its purpose. And going back to the question of what the negative's role is in the debate, um, in order to, or sorry, people are joining. <laughs> Uh, going back to the question of what the next role is in debate, um, they get to propose a counter plan because they only have to negate the AF and they're not really held to the resolution. Um, hi, Candice. And hey, Maggie. And the only thing that um, they really have to do is prove an alternative mechanism to solve the AF with a valid opportunity cost. So something else is kind of really important when thinking about the idea of a counter plan and why the negative gets to propose one or how it would be valid in the context of debate is the idea of competition. So the word competition basically means that there is a real opportunity cost between doing the plan and doing the counter plan. So the neg has to demonstrate with evidence that the judge must choose between the world of the AF or the counter plan. For example, if the plan abolishes the police via Congress and the counter plan changes mandatory minimum sentencing, this wouldn't be competitive because there's no opportunity cost, or you could do both of these things at the same time. However, if the counter plan is that states should enact the counter plan instead of Congress, then the NEG has some reason why Congress doing, and the NEG has some reason why doing Congress doing the plan is bad, then this is an example of a real cost. Because not only do they have a separate mechanism, um, for example, the states versus Congress, but they also have some reason why Congress doing the AF is bad, which would create or incur this cost. But that might make a little bit more sense later when we talk through a specific example. So what I just mentioned, um, the idea of a disad to the plan is sometimes called the net benefit. And the, a counter plan is always paired with a net benefit or an added advantage or profit that's gained from choosing the counter plan. Um, for example, the AF might solve the economy and court legitimacy and the counter plan might solve both of these things, but also solve um, diversionary war by um, not linking to the elections disad. So net benefits could be internal or external. Um, external means they're just a disad that you can kind of read on your own. So the elections disad, for example, or the federalism disad, it's its own um, entity or it's its own like off case position in the context of debate. But it also could be a net benefit to the counter plan if a counter plan um, doesn't also link to the disad. But net benefits could also be internal, which means that they're kind of glued to the counter plan text, and they can't just be read as a disad against the plan. So maybe it's just some reason why the specific mechanism of the counter plan is good, but it's not necessarily a reason why the mechanism of the plan is bad. Um, and then the last thing before we get into the two counter plans in the 1 and C and the 2 and C and looking through some examples is how you debate the counter plan um, in the context of a debate round. So it's kind of weird to think about weighing the plan versus a counter plan because they're both mechanisms to kind of solve the same impacts. So what really matters is proving that the counter plan solves enough of the affirmative and that the net benefit outweighs any reason why the counter plan doesn't solve the AF. So if we're thinking about impacts, which um, I'm sure is something that you've heard in previous weeks, um, you wanna think about the impacts of the AF versus the impacts of the net benefit to the counter plan. 
And those things are really what you're weighing against each other. And the counter plan itself is just a way to kind of mitigate some of the impacts of the AF. So if the counter plan solves the entirety of the AF, then there's not really an impact that the AF can weigh against this net benefit. But if the counter plan only solves a portion of the AF, then the judge would have to decide whether or not this portion of the AF um, outweighs the net benefits of the counter plan. Um, and so the debating would occur about those impacts. So let's talk about um, what the counter plan includes in the 1NC and the 2NC. So in the 1NC, things that you have to include when you're reading a counter plan um, are the plan text and a solvency card. And then at some point in the debate, either attach to the counter plan, what we just talked about, um, an internal net benefit, or as a separate disad, you need a net benefit of some sort, but it can be read in different places. So a plan text looks just like the plan text that you would read um, at the beginning of your app. Uh, it would start with an actor um, saying that they should take some sort of action that's meant to solve the app. So for example, um, the 50 states should um, get rid of the death penalty would be an example of a counter plan text because it's a different actor than the app, but still solves, um, excuse me, the impacts of the app. And then you normally want to have a solvency card, which outlines how, just like a solvency card in the app would outline how the plan uh, solves whatever the AF's impacts are, this would outline how this different mechanism also solves um, the impacts of the AF. And then the net benefit is just something that the uh, counter plan doesn't link to, but is still a reason why the plan is bad. Um, and just to clarify, when I say the counter plan doesn't link to, um, it's exactly the same thing as how a plan could link to a disad, um, or there's kind of a connection between uh, the plan and a disad that would cause some sort of bad thing to happen. Um, but that bad thing wouldn't occur in the context of the counter plan because it's a different mechanism um, or it's a different actor and maybe it's not the government doing something but um, private companies um, that kind of avoids that action. And then um, in the 2AC, we want to think about having a variety of answers to counter plans. And some of these things you may have seen before, but some of them might be new. Um, so there's a, an acronym that's really helpful when thinking about answers um, in the 2AC and it's STOP. So in the 2AC, we want to have um, solvency deficits, theory, offense, and permutations. Um, and I'll go through each of these things, but that's what the acronym STOP stands for. So um, a solvency deficit is a reason why the counter plan doesn't solve some or all of the AF. And usually they're tied to the internal links that you read in the 1AC. So a lot of times AFs want to have really specific internal links, um, reasons why the specific mechanism of the plan solves the impacts of the AF. Because then um, if you, if the counter plan does something that is not intrinsically tied to those internal links, you have a built-in solvency deficit. So an example of a solvency deficit would be, um, in the context of the state's counter plan, um, a reason why the federal government is necessary to solve whatever the plan does. So um, this, the state's counter plan would say that the state's acting in unity would be able to achieve that same object. But if you have a reason why, um, for example, the federal government is the only organization that has control over this particular issue, then that's a reason why um, you, the counter plan couldn't solve 100% of um, the app. And then the next thing that you want to have is theory. And we won't really spend a ton of time talking about theory now, um, but this is a reason why the counter plan should not be allowed in debate. And basically, um, theory arguments are reasons why the counter plan is maybe um, abusive or cheating um, because it allows the negative to kind of make up imaginary worlds that aren't um, fair, uh, that the affirmative should be able to predict them and have to debate them. So for example, if you read a counter plan that had like every person in the United States do a certain action that would mean that war doesn't happen. That would probably be an, a non-theoretically legitimate counter plan because you're fiatting that everybody in the world does something, which um, obviously would never happen in real life. And also it results in just stopping the impacts of the app instead of actually getting into a debate about um, what the mechanisms are that could resolve those impacts. Um, offense, we also won't spend a ton of time focusing on, but these are basically reasons why either the counter plan is bad and causes some other impact, 
Um, so a reason why the counterpoint is bad. Or a reason why the AF is wrong about some piece of the net benefit that causes um, some impact to occur. So this could be, for example, if they say, if the impact to one of their counterplans is executive flexibility, for example, then instead of um, reading defense to the net benefit, the negative team or the AF team could just say that executive flexibility is bad. And then they could just get into a debate about whether or not um, which, who is on the true side of that impact. Um, and so that would be an example of an impact turn. Um, and the last thing that we wanna make sure to have is a permutation. Um, and so a perm is something that combines both the action of the counterplan and the action of the AF. And the purpose is to indicate that the counterplan and the AF are not mutually exclusive or not competitive, as we kind of discussed above. Um, another way of thinking about the perm that might be helpful is that um, the combination of the plan and the counterplan would still result in solving the net benefit. So there's no opportunity cost to doing one or the other, both at the same time. Um, because usually competition is generated by the opportunity cost of the net benefit. So for example, um, if the AF has a reason why the combination of Congress and the states working together um, to do the AF would still result in um, not linking to the federalism dissent because it, doesn't, it no longer looks like the federal government is just taking control over a certain action, um, then this would be a reason why the permutation would resolve the net benefit. Um, and so all of these things are kind of theoretically hard to wrap your minds around. And so hopefully it'll be a little bit um, more helpful when we look at a specific example. But those are all the um, categories of arguments that we wanna have in the 2AC. And um, before we start thinking about a specific example, I'll talk a little bit about the 2NC, um, if you're extending a counterplan, but we won't go super in depth um, in the context of the 2NC. So um, something to think about is in the 2NC, you should have a clear explanation of how the counterplan solves the AF. Um, I like to think about going to each advantage and explaining why the counterplan solves that advantage. Um, and having this typed out, ready to go, so that you have a clear explanation for what the counterplan does will be really helpful um, to explaining to the judge how the counterplan accesses the app's impacts. And then uh, when answering, um, we're going to focus on solvency deficits and permutations because I think those are the things that you're most likely to see. So when answering solvency deficits, you want to think about reasons why your mechanism avoids some of these impacts that they're e explaining that you can't access. Um, so for example, uh, you just wanna say why the counterplan solves an issue that an F identifies. So if they have a reason why the federal government is key to acting in an area, then you would wanna have a card about why uh, the federal gov government isn't key to acting in that particular area, or for the states have acted in that area before, um, or some other way to kind of mitigate this piece of evidence that they have identified. Um, so that one is pretty straightforward. And when answering the perm, you usually want to uh, explain the links to your net benefit um, to isolate why um, you can't combine the actions of the plan and the counter plan um, because they would cause the impact of the net benefit to still occur um, because it's just the inclusion of the plan and that combination that still makes this bad impact happen. Um, so that was a lot of information um, at once, I'm going to stop sharing, but if anybody has questions, um, feel free to ask me, and then we're going to look at a specific example that Andrew is going to um, show us. Um, okay, well, Andrew, if you want to hop on and show the example that we have put together. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Andrew. I also go to Emory like Maggie does. Uh, and I'm excited to be here and talk about counterplans with you all. So um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. And ah, I cannot. Uh, uh, Sorry, I can give you sharing powers. Okay, no worries. Um. Okay. You should be able to share. Okay, awesome.
can you all see a Word document? Awesome. Okay. So this is an example of a counter plan from the auto packet. It says uh, it's designed to be run against the marijuana app that was written for uh, the high school open division. Uh, it says basically um, that we can do the affirmatives, uh, what they advocated their policy change of uh, legalizing marijuana across the United States via state action instead of federal action. And that's reflected in the counterplan text, which begins with the 50 states and relevant territories of the US. Uh, and then it, it basically argues that since that we uh, can do that through a different uh, level of government, that is better because uh, this is designed to be paired with a federalism DA that says that if we have the federal government do the plan, it would infringe on uh, the authority of states, which is bad for their ability to um, make policies in other uh, areas. So this card uh, in the 1 and C basically just talks about why state laws are important for the industry of legal marijuana and says that uh, uh, past examples of states legalizing it have been effective in uh, like going against the federal ban and that it is not necessary for it to be legalized at the federal level in order for uh, it to in order for the app's impacts to be solved. So that's the general premise of the counter plan. That is the strategy that the NEG is trying to forward. And the reason it's strategic is because uh, it allows the NEG a way of accessing the app's advantages. It doesn't rely on them winning defense to their solvency mechanism or their internal links or the impacts. They can just say that they solve it as well, which is another strategic way for the NEG to sort of get ahead in the debate. The AF has uh, all the responses that uh, Maggie just mentioned uh, in the 2EC section, and I sort of made a couple examples of them for you here. So uh, we can go through it like sort of uh, line by line. There are three main categories that I chose that Maggie touched on. I will not be talking about the uh, offense against the net benefit or the defense to it, because usually in a debate like this, you would put those arguments on the federals and this at itself. Normally, uh, unless the uh, net benefit to a counter plan is internal, uh, which is something we can talk about later if you have questions about it. The place that you will do those two things is on whatever DA the NEG claims the counter plan is in, like, has as a net benefit. And the other three, which are perms, solvency deficits, and theory arguments will be done on the counter plan itself. So the first one, very simple, uh, just perm do both. Uh, Maggie was just talking about it right before uh, sort of I started talking about this. It basically just says that we can do the plan and the counter plan at the same time. And there is uh, some reason that uh, doing so would mean that the uh, federalism DA is no longer applicable. So the AF might say in this instance, because the federal and the state governments do it at the same time, it looks like they're working together, not that the federal government is encroaching on their authority, which means that it prevents the link. Uh, that would be the main sort of argument for a permutation. The second category, which is sort of the next four uh, F7 headers uh, in this uh, Word document, is that the counterplan fails. This is a solvency deficit argument. There are actually three different solvency deficits uh, in the form of three different cards in this file. So the first one basically just says that uh, states don't have enough power to create enough confidence in the legal uh, status of marijuana to uh, create enough like uh, business and uh, ability for it to be used uh, that the app says is necessary and so the app says that only the federal government legalizing it across the entire United States is capable of making people confident that they can actually sort of engage in the legal marijuana industry with any sort of like uh, protection from criminal like being prosecuted. Uh, the second argument uh, is sort of related to that. It just says an example of a federal policy that was like uh, they increased the ability to like uh, raid people's like businesses who are like growing and selling and distributing and it says that people are really scared about that because they could like lose their product they could lose uh, their like uh, businesses and they could go to jail which means that they're not likely to uh, grow the industry even after the counter plan which means the plan is necessary and then the last argument is just that like uh, there are financial regulations that exist at the federal level that cannot be controlled by states. So even if the states say this is legal, the federal government will just be like, well, uh, you can still only have um, 
cash for your businesses. So banks can't fund you. Uh, investors can't invest in your legal marijuana business. Uh, you can't make contracts with uh, potential like uh, investors or with customers. And that means that the industry will just never be viable unless the federal government does it. So the NEG would need to have ways of answering all of those problems the app has identified in order to make the counter plan a viable strategy. They need to prove why the state's legalizing and not the federal government is capable of overcoming all of the problems that the app has identified. Uh, the last argument category in this 2AC block is uh, theory. And it says that the state's counter plan is bad for debate. It is uh, something that lets the NEG advocate the entire AF. Uh, it means that we don't talk about why criminal justice reform is actually good or bad. We just talk about who should do it. And as Maggie mentioned earlier, uh, it is not an, a realistic policy action. The 50 states have never undertaken a criminal justice reform all at once together. So it's not predictable and it's difficult to answer. And that's just all under the umbrella of reasons why it is like bad for the activity. It is difficult to debate. It undermines the sort of clash between the AF and the NEG. And it's a reason the NEG team should lose for introducing it. Uh, once again, I know that was also a lot of information. So if anybody has any questions about any part of either the 1NC or the 2AC uh, in the context of what Maggie explained earlier, uh, please feel free to ask. I can also just like re-explain anything if you need me to. The only thing I would add um, about what Andrew just said is that um, he did a really good job of explaining how each of the solvency deficits is tied to an impact that the AF would have in the 1AC. So when you think about creating solvency deficits, you want to make sure that there is a tangible reason why that solvency deficit is important. So for example, um, a lot of these I'm sure are um, tied to a econ advantage um, because of regulatory certainty or um, financial regulations, which was number three, um, are reasons why uh, the having a legalized marijuana uh, kind of industry would be good for the economy, and that would stop some sort of economic impact that they would have in the 1AC. And so if those things don't happen, then that would trigger that economic impact still. Um, and so each of these solvency deficits is clearly tied to some impact that the app can go for in the 2AR against the net benefit. Yeah, that's really important. A lot of the time when I'm like judging a debate in high school, uh, the issue with the AF is just that they win that the plan is different from the counter plan in some way, but they don't win why the distinction matters. So I think that explaining that well and impacting it, as Maggie said, is really important. Um, well, feel free to ask questions um, again, but if nobody um, has questions, we will we can stick around on Zoom for a second, and I can stop the recording. But um, that was just a brief introduction to counterplans.